What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Today, it is my pleasure to be joined by Dr. John Hawley. Dr. Hawley, how are you doing today? Very well. Nice and sunny down here in Melbourne, Australia. It's probably a little chillier up where you are, Mike. So uh, we will soldier on. It looks like you do have some beautiful weather. I, I'm quite envious considering the trend here nowadays. But Dr. Hawley, for our listeners who might not be familiar with you and your work, can you provide us a, a, a brief background about yourself? Sure, very brief. Um, I'm currently the director of the Mary McKillop Institute for Health Research and also the um, head of my own research group, which is exercise and nutrition. So pretty much everything I do has a focus on exercise and nutrition from right, I guess, way back from when performance uh, with athletes, but now much more in the health sphere, uh, more community orientated. Lots of stuff that we're going to talk about, the time-restricted feeding, the fasting, uh, when when should you exercise, when should you eat, all that sort of stuff. So good group of people around me and focus mainly, as I said, on the exercise nutrient interactions and how they impact on health, muscle metabolism, circadian biology, et cetera. Excellent. With that being said, I think you are a perfect candidate for the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Dr. Hawley, you're a prolific researcher when it comes to sports nutrition, nutrition for general health, and, and we're very happy to have you on and to gain your insight. As you mentioned, our, our topic of discussion today is mainly chrononutrition. We'll be diving into some uh, intermittent fasting strategies as well, but to set the stage for our talk today, can you outline for us why chrononutrition matters or why it's becoming such an interesting realm of research. When we look at the circadian rhythm of nutrient metabolism, the hormones involved in this, what are the major players? And when we look at the research on this biology, what what seems to be going on? Is is there a better or worse time to be eating? Okay, that was actually 15 questions in one, but I'll <laughs> And answer them. Firstly, your first point is very valid. There's been a real explosion, first of all, in interest in circadian biology. And as you said, the time that we eat, to a lesser extent, the time that we exercise, because that's not been very well researched. But this stems from the Nobel Prize being awarded a few years back to, uh, to three circadian biologists. So that's the first point. There has been a massive explosion. And that's not just true in the tri uh, scientific area. There's been a massive explosion and in interest in the lay press. So you often get, you know, newspapers, magazines talking about circadian biology, which is which is quite interesting because I'm pretty sure most people don't actually know what's going on. So that's the first point. Second point, look, again, without giving your listeners a, a boring uh, 101 circadian metabolism lecture, think of it like this. Think of it as something that we've got in the brain called the supercharismatic nucleus. That is what I would call mission control. That is the main governor of almost all circadian biology. Now, having said that, we fine tune what we do, what we eat, and all the cues that may be responsible for those things by all the peripheral tissues, the liver, uh, the muscle, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the concept before we sort of launch into any specifics is that nucleus, the super charismatic nucleus uh, in the hypothalamus controls, if you like, the overall circadian biology, and then we can fine tune it. Now, an example of that for your listeners, again, is that, you know, when you fly, especially when you fly from Australia to the state, you know, you go through time zones that messes up both the central and the peripheral cues. And again, to get into alignment as quickly as possible in the time zone that you're traveling to is, is a very, very good thing to do. So uh, and I'll give your listeners and again, an example. I frequently would fast on a plane and not have meals because meals in themselves are, if you like, peripheral time givers. And that gets into your, your third or fourth question. I mean, we've got several appetite hormones, ghrelin, leptin, adiponectin. And again, these are all, if you like, fine tuners of the main circadian biology. But I guess the most interesting thing was a study I read several years ago, I think the two thir 2013 in obesity, uh, where they looked at the circadian biology of some of these hormones. And even when you change the feeding pattern and you change certain other things very strictly in the laboratory there was still this you know three meal a day type of phasic shift that we look at and i guess the question is here is this an evolutionary thing that we've just got used to eating three meals a day and therefore three meals a day seems to coincide with our natural circadian biology 
or is this something we can alter? And we really can't answer that um, unless you do crazy studies and take people into caves with no peripheral cues of light and no exercise and everything else. And then again, you lose them after perhaps 28 to 30 days. But for the most part, they're very, very regular and very, very regulated. Absolutely. You provided a great example there, which I think while the listeners of our podcast tend to be quite savvy, that they're very interested in, in the science on this topic. I think everyone can get down with this uh, example of, you know, consider flying and how that messes up, you know, your patterns and how it's a good idea to align what you're doing with your circadian rhythms. When it comes to nutrition specifically, and for those who are thinking, yeah, I mean, I get it when it comes to that aspect of life. Uh, it def- it should make sense for nutrition too. When we look at the hormones involved in nutrient metabolism, perhaps let's consider cortisol, insulin. Does, th- does there seem to be a, a natural rhythm for these that would indicate that perhaps certain nutrients are better metabolized at certain points in the day? That's a really good question. And if I had the answer to that, you know, maybe I'd have got the Nobel Prize instead of the other guys. But having said that, yes, your answer is is partly uh, push and pull. And what I mean by that is that any time you take in nutrients, for example, I've just had breakfast, it's morning here in Australia, there will be a rise in insulin, there will be a rise in glucose. You know, the normal physiology pertains, insulin is there to dispose of glucose into insulin sensitive tissues. If I didn't eat, what would happen? Well, we're most insulin sensitive uh, actually in the latter part of the day, not not in the morning part, which is kind of interesting and seems, you know, somewhat paradoxical. But there's a lot of what I said. So the push cues are when you actually take in nutrients and you get a response to those. Your question is really, you know, what happens if we don't do that? What happens perhaps if we're fasting? Well, obviously, all those cues are dampened. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, we can talk about fasting as we, you know, get into the talk a little bit more. But certainly fasting seems to, if you like, neutralize and dampen some of these cues. Now, is that a good thing? Well, there's evidence certainly from animal models, a lot of it from from worms and a lot of it from uh, small primates, mouse, rat models, et cetera, et cetera, to show that prolonged fasting and bouts of fasting actually prolong the lifespan. Now, is that evidence there in humans? No, it's not at the moment it's definitely not is it a good idea to to fast periodically to reset the clock yes perhaps it is um certainly you've hinted again at the travel and we'll use that as an example when you travel you know often (laughs) these days luckily i'm in business class and it's amazing when the stewardess is coming around and they want to look after you which is all very nice and when you refuse a meal they say well dr hall you know (laughs) you're in business class you can have this you can have that i say yes but i don't eat at three o'clock in the morning i'm going to i'm going to arrive in los angeles at six o'clock well i'll reset my body clock and have breakfast they just don't get it now, for shift workers and people working like that, I would have thought they would be most attuned to to sort of eating at least because you can't exercise on a plane, but at least thinking of the cues that they could manipulate. And, and they don't for the most part. And I guess another issue that is not my area of expertise, but shift work again. Shift work plays havoc with both the, uh, you know, light dark cycle, the feeding fasting pattern, and also, you know, when are you going to exercise type thing. So we know quite clearly from the epidemiological data that shift workers have uh, less of a lifespan. I mean, lifespan doesn't measure everything. Quality of life is also very important. But we're often getting asked questions about shift workers. And that's a very fertile area of research again. And shift workers, it's very, very hard to give advice. Do they skip meals during the night? Would they eat, you know, when they normally should do? It's a real quandary, shift workers. So if you're a shift worker on a permanent, you know, day night shift, you can probably do something to rescue the deleterious effects of, of messing your body clock up. But if you're on a, a 10 day phase where you're doing night work and then you shift into day, that's very, very difficult. And that I would suggest is not a healthy lifestyle. Now, of course, you know, you can't help that. And I'm not suggesting that you don't work. But on the other hand, it's some it's some it's certainly something that, you know, if you didn't have to do it, I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, I think shift work is a fascinating area because, as you mentioned, it, it's been quite clear for a while now that there are deleterious effects to shift work particularly when we look at nutrition this was a concept that was perhaps more popular 
maybe like over a decade ago or so now, but there was this notion. It was, you know, you don't eat carbs after six because they will be inherently stored uh, as fat. You know, just just pick the spot on your body. You eat carbs after six. They're going there. They're going to increase your body fat independent of calorie intake. And then we had we had this shift, right? So as people became more interested in science, we have more evidence-based practitioners uh, in our industry. They started reminding everyone, hey, w- what's really important when it it comes to weight gain when it comes to body composition outcomes is your total calorie intake that that's kind of the base of this pyramid and what matters most but as you're alluding to here there the people in the past they probably weren't completely wrong when it comes to the idea of consuming a large amount of calories later in the evening as opposed to earlier in the day is that true well, look, let, let's just go back one step before we go forward. I mean, the, the interesting thing about all the nutrition recommendations, and you've hit the nail on the head, you know, a decade ago we did this and now we do that. This nutrition area, exercise area, like everything, goes in cycles. So what what is sort of preached today, you know, 20 years ago may have not been. So let's make that point first of all. I mean, there are trends and there are cycles and there are fads and, you know, this diet comes in, this diet goes out. So that's number one. Number two, I just want to make the point here that in no national nutrition guidelines is there any mention of the timing of the food. And again, you've you've said, Mike, quite clearly and quite correctly that, you know, we pay attention to the energy intake, the calorie intake. And that's very, very important. You know, the meal size, the composition, whether it's carbs or fat or whether you're on a, you know, ketogenic diet, all this sort of stuff. But there is no mention of timing in there. And, you know, I guess... One thing that if if your listeners take it away from this show is that that the timing of nutrition is now becoming very, very important for for metabolic health and maybe also, you know, for health and fitness for the athlete. So that's a very, very, very important point. And I think it's been missed. And I think when we revise the national guidelines in the various countries next time round, there has to be mention of the timing of the food intake, not just the energy intake, as you pointed out, not just, you know, whether to eat carbs you know, between the hours of four and five thirty, or whatever it happens to be, it's just not there at the moment, Mike. It's just not mentioned in any of the national nutrition guidelines, and we've combed them. And you think this is incredible? Surely we've missed a bit of the boat here. So I think that's something that we're going to see, and I think more attention will be paid to the timing of nutrition rather than me just saying to you, you know, carbs at this time, no fats at this time, breakfast later or evening meal. You know, we can get bamboozled in recommendations and a simple message needs to get out to the public because, you know, in the States, in Australia, even the degree of obesity is is just out of control. It really is a big problem. And, and, and that's a problem of, you know, energy intake to energy output. But again, just by simple messages and clearly the message that we're given at the moment isn't working. I think we can change that and hopefully reverse the trend or at least flatten the curve of the increase because at the moment it's a it's a very long-term problem yeah timing of nutrition is such an interesting nuance for the points that we just mentioned but also when we look at things like the impact of breakfast on cardiometabolic markers and weight loss and a lot of people will look at the observational data and see that there's this association between skipping breakfast and type 2 diabetes or weight gain and and they'll say well you know that's just because that the person is overweight so they're they're skipping a meal and it's not that skipping breakfast causes you to be overweight but then we have these more controlled trials where we see that perhaps shifting a larger portion of your calories to earlier in the day can improve appetite throughout the day, can improve weight loss outcomes. Uh, subconsciously, you're a bit more active, and we see uh, usually some superior postprandial responses in terms of health, which I think are all super interesting. Yeah. You know, that's, again, you've obviously read the literature very thoroughly. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of trends to, you know, should we eat breakfast? Should we skip breakfast? Should we have a later breakfast? And, and I guess this is a good bridge into this concept that, you know, we'll, we'll discuss is this time restricted feeding. And the first studies there, let me just give the, the audience again a little bit of a history. The first studies uh, were done in overweight individuals. And what they found, they took a group of a, about 150 overweight males and females And they just asked them to monitor their food intake. And the amazing thing was that, you know, a large proportion of the food, the energy was consumed after 12 o'clock with a lot of discretionary, you know, let's call it snacking, but evening, late night, evening, snacking, ice cream, beer, you know, all the things that we sort of like, but we're, you know, you're not meant to have sort of thing, at least not before you go to bed. 
And one of the things that I think has been ignored, and this is really where technology has driven the science, is we now have these devices, you know, called continuous glucose monitors, where you can actually monitor the glucose concentration of, of patients, of athletes, or of any individual overnight. And that's when we started to really see that when you eat really late, you really screw up your glucose control overnight. Um, and again, I won't go into all the details of all the studies, but it's quite clear now that late night snacking and large meals later on in the day, particularly as you've hinted, you know, a large carbohydrate base are responsible for what we call these nocturnal spikes in glucose during the night. And you think, well, you know, why would you spike in glucose? You're asleep. Nothing's happening. Well, things are still going on in the body there. The body's trying to still dispose of that massive glucose load. And we know from the cardiovascular studies that these excursions of glucose in the night are very, very bad for endothelial function, very bad for cardiometabolic disease. So now that I guess the, the simple message is, you know, as you've already pointed out, perhaps eat the same or less if you can, but make sure you eat it a little bit earlier. And that's all time restricted feeding is. And again, I'm going to ask your listeners, obviously I can't talk to them, but just think of the time which your first meal was today. And, you know, I've had breakfast around eight o'clock. I try and finish my evening meal by six o'clock. That's my window of eating. OK, that's quite an early one, but it's 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 still, you know, 10 to 12 hours. If you're someone in the audience listening now and your time between your first energy intake of the day and your last is 14 hours or even greater, I would say you really need to modify the timing of your nutrient intake. So the studies now, and it's preliminary days, and there are very few human clinical trials long term, lasting, you know, three months, six months, nine months or longer. But clearly the evidence is that the A, the more energy you intake, but B, the more energy you intake later at night, the worse the prognosis for a lot of cardiometabolic disorders. So I would be recommending that uh, people who are listening, particularly if you're trying to lose weight, uh, and I don't like the term weight because it tells us nothing about body composition. But, you know, if you're trying to lose that scale weight initially, then try and limit your food intake to, you know, between nine and 10 hours a day if you can. And you'll be surprised. I mean, what's yours, Mike, for example? You just just give us your average weekday, not a weekend because you tend to eat differently there. What time do you normally have breakfast? Breakfast probably going down at 7.30 a.m. Okay, last intake on a, on a weekday on average, be honest. Around seven. Okay, so you're not bad. You're around 12, okay? You, you, mm -hmm. you, that's very, very typical for most uh, Americans. But again, the trend is for people who are overweight and obese, and particularly those who don't exercise, uh, that, that they sort of spiral out to 14, 15 hours a day. And if that's, you know, one of your listeners there, you might want to, you know, either think about trying to reduce that window. And of course, by reducing the window, by and large, because you've got less time to eat the same food, you probably will eat less. So, you know, then the question becomes, is it just eating less or is it the time restricted uh, feeding? Um, which is a very good question. And, you know, I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation here, but there is one study which has, has lo actually looked at that question when they fed subjects in a metabolic ward, <clears throat> excuse me, and it is the time restricted feeding. They gave the same calories, exactly the same calories over the course of a, a 12 hour day versus a, I have to say, a very strict one, eight o'clock till two o'clock in the afternoon, which is, you know, quite socially unacceptable. You're never going to get a date if you finish eating at two o'clock in the afternoon. But notwithstanding that, this proof of concept study showed quite clearly that it was the time restricted feeding. In other words, prolonging that fasting cycle rather than the energy intake. So that's very, very strong evidence, albeit in a controlled laboratory situation. So reduce your window of eating. That's the that's the take home. You're referring to the Sutton trial. Is that correct? I am indeed. Yes. In cell metabolism. Yep. You do know your stuff. So as you, as you know, <laughs> That's a really great study in one respect. But on the other hand, you know, we're doing this in journal club in the students and their students say, well, you know, who's going to finish eating at two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon? It's socially unacceptable, but scientifically um, very robust and a very strong study. So, again, I guess it comes uh, as, as in your job, if you're a shift worker or anything else, you've got to weigh up the science and the practicalities. It's all right for me or you to recommend something. But if that's completely impossible for someone's schedule, then you know, you've got to balance the two up. And I think sometimes we forget that as scientists.
in this area of time restricted feeding, there are a number of rabbit holes we can dive down here. You made so many excellent points there that I would like to get into further. But perhaps starting with when we look at the time restricted feeding data, it's particularly robust in rodents, right? It, it seems like the, just shortening the feeding window, uh, aligning energy intake with the circadian with circadian rhythm just has this potent impact on health and longevity. But when we turn to the human trials, the Sutton trial is fascinating. But when we look at this original paper, which was uh, Gill and Panda, I believe, where they sh they shortened the feeding window just by a couple of hours. Uh, I think it was like something from like fourteen hours per day to ten, some Correct. something along those lines. And and we saw that without any other dietary advice, just shortening the feeding window resulted in pretty substantial weight loss on average. And as we know, uh, weight loss in general is going to have a, a pretty potent impact on overall health. Follow-up trials seem to find very similar outcomes. And this led many to propose that, well, uh, these intermittent fasting strategies like time-restricted feeding, they don't have any unique benefits on on health. It's simply a product of restricting calories and losing weight. But based on what you said, and even your own personal practices, it, it sounds like that you, you're pretty convinced that there are unique benefits just outside of restricting calorie intake from these strategies. Well, look, again, you've obviously read the literature. The Gill and Panda study is an interesting one, because if you dive down deep into the discussion there, they will tell you that of the eight subjects out of the original 156 that they chose, when they went back and looked at their dietary records, they actually ate 20% less calories. So in that study, you can't really say it's time-restricted feeding. And again, whoever reviewed that paper missed that point. So if you go back and look, I can absolutely guarantee you because I've got it as a slide. Yes, they lost around three kilos. And the interesting thing in that study, Mike, is that they actually kept it off for a year, which is actually quite unusual because usually you get this rebound effect the weight comes down during a trial or an intervention but then if you follow the subjects for the next six or nine months it comes back theirs didn't they were very good at keeping to the time restricted feeding but again in that original study as you pointed out yes they had substantial weight loss but it was probably due to lower energy intake number one am i convinced of the human data mm. Um, if I was a rat, I'd be very convinced, as you said, you know, the animal data is very, very clear. But again, let's make another point here. And we've just made this in a in a paper that we published in Diabetologia a couple of months ago. When you compare man and mouse, there are massive, massive differences. Number one, they're nocturnal. We're not unless you're a shift worker. Number two, they voluntarily choose to exercise. If you put a treadmill or a, a running wheel in an animal, they will voluntarily choose to run six to eight kilometers a day which is quite a long way if you've got little legs sort of thing I mean that's that's phenomenal we don't we choose to be inactive thirdly we tend to space our mail, meals out throughout the day you know this three meal a day type of pattern animals if you put food in their cages will literally gorge it all down in one sitting and lastly I don't want to labor the point but I do want to stress that you know we have to be very very careful when extrapolating the results from from animal models to humans is that particularly during exercise we tend to preferentially use fuels which are already stored within the muscle what we call endogenous fuel stores animals rely to a much larger extent on circulating fuel in the bloodstream humans don't so there are five major differences there between species so when we say as you did that the animal studies are pretty convincing and i agree i'm agreeing with you I just put a little caveat in there and think, well, you know, man isn't a, a 75 or 80 kilo mouse and there are massive, massive differences. There are data coming out which are, I won't say convincingly strong, but certainly they would be positive with regards to time restricted feeding. Uh, and again, I guess one of the questions I'm frequently asked is what's the difference between, between time restricted feeding and some of these fasting diets? Well, essentially there doesn't appear to be on the surface much but of course there is the time restricted feeding really tries to convince the individual to eat uh, in synchronization with our circadian biology whereas these diets which have you know one day on one day off fasting or the five plus two or you know the 800 kilocalorie there's you know just as many diets as there are books on this at the moment they tend to just try and look at a period of fasting now 
that doesn't align with circadian biology. So in the long term, I think the time restricted feeding strategy, because it does align with the circadian rhythms and because we're probably more in synchronization with some of the appetite hormones, leptin, adiponectin, ghrelin, uh, I think that is probably a better longer term hold than just, you know, the prolonged fasting type of, uh, of, of protocols that have been, I guess, receiving a lot of airplay, but without very little evidence, some of them. It seems like the the most benefits are derived from early time restricted feeding. We mentioned that the last meal of the day in the Sutton trial was at 2 p.m. And the entire concept behind early time restricted feeding is to uh, better align our nutrition with our circadian biology. But when people use time restricted feeding, uh, generally speaking, at least from from what I've seen, is that they tend to skip breakfast. And then so maybe their first meals in in the early afternoon and then they're, you know, stop, they stop eating maybe around around eight or so, which would be in in opposition to this early time restricted feeding format. Would you say that there are unique benefits to an extended period of fasting regardless uh, of where you're putting your calories? Or do you think the research is pretty clear that early time restricted feeding is where it's at if you're trying to get unique cardiometabolic benefits just outside of restricting calorie intake? Yeah, look, that's a that's a great question. Um, you should be on a grant review panel perhaps somewhere, but... Um... <laughs> Now, look, there are very few studies. Firstly, let's deal with this issue very quickly of early versus late time restricted feeding. As you pointed out, there doesn't seem to be much difference. There's a a few studies. There's one done by um, a group just down the road, Leonie Helbrun in in Adelaide here in Australia, and there's a couple of others. And really, they're not that clear on whether, you know, having your early breakfast and finishing early or late afternoon versus starting at midday and finishing. it, It doesn't seem to make that much difference. My preference is not to actually skip breakfast at all, is just to push that breakfast a little bit later. So our advice to people, and we've just actually published a study a couple of weeks ago, the first author was was Evelyn Parr from uh, my laboratory here in Melbourne, and she looked at the feasibility of doing time-restricted feeding with uh, with type 2 diabetics. And all we did was push the breakfast out a little bit later and push the early evening meal in just a couple of hours earlier as well. And that seemed to have profound effects, again, on nocturnal blood glucose concentration. So during the evening. And again, I guess the answer to your question is there isn't one answer to your question. There's not one size fits all. It really depends on the population. So for someone who has poor glycemic control, bringing that evening meal in earlier by a couple of hours is likely to be most beneficial for their control of glucose during the evening. Now, if glucose control isn't a problem and you've got someone who just, you know, needs to lose a little bit of weight perhaps or is conscious that they do, then the point is, does it really matter? And the answer at the moment is that we don't have that answer. But again, it's population specific. Uh, One of the questions that I've been asked many times is what about athletes? And at the moment, I can't see, unless you're trying to strip weight, why time-restricted feeding would be used by at least athletes who are in endurance events where they train several times a day. And we're getting a little bit off track here, but um, the athlete is no different to the the man or woman in the street. They read about the latest fads. And I've had a lot of questions from athletes saying, you know, should I be time-restricted feeding? At the moment, I, I can't possibly see why the athlete would want to do that when their main aim is to train hard and to put back fuel as quickly as possible. Um, so for them, I, I cannot see a benefit. But again, in answer to your question, the time restricted feed in, I think if I had to give a simple one message now is push the breakfast out later, pull the evening meal in earlier. And no matter who you are, you are likely to get some cardiometabolic benefits, uh, be that good glucose control, be it a little bit of weight loss. Uh, and again, a point I want to make here, Mike, just, you know, while I'm just thinking about it, while it's in my head is we've done a study recently. We haven't got the data back yet. It's been analyzed um, in a lab in Maastricht in the Netherlands by Dr. Luke van Loon for us is that these prolonged fasting uh, diets are, are great perhaps for shedding weight and weight loss and everything else. But one thing which people haven't considered is what do they do for muscle mass? Now, I bring that up because we've shown quite clearly five or six years ago, as have other groups have been able to reproduce the data very, very robustly, that any time you reduce your calorie intake, in other words, your energy intake, by as little as 500 kilocalories a day, you get a reduction in your basal rate of protein synthesis. In other words, while you're sitting around, 
as we're doing on this interview at the moment during the day, your rates of protein synthesis are reduced by around 20% when you're in energy deficit. Now, that's a very bad thing because, as we know, metabolic health is tied very closely to our muscle mass and our body composition. So one of the things that I'm very wary about on these fasting diets, particularly, you know, you take the five plus two diet where you don't intake calories for, you know, two days, 48 hours. What is that going to do to your muscle protein synthesis? Well, it's going to reduce it. Will you get it back during the five days? Probably not. So if you look at it over the long term, you're gradually looking at a decline in muscle mass. And I think that's very, very, very dangerous. And I don't think that anyone has really thought about that at the moment. And uh, we have, and we'll hopefully have the answer, you know, probably by early new year. And that would be a very interesting finding if we can show that these prolonged fasting diets reduce your basal protein synthesis. That is not good for health outcomes. I really like that you transition to athletes because I, I'm in the same boat. I primarily work with athletes and I've gotten a lot of questions from many of them on if they should be using time restricted feeding. A, a lot of these guys are in high school, college, and most of them need to put on weight. And they're asking me if they should be reducing their feeding window and they're already struggling to put on weights. And I'm like, man, like why, why do we have you? spend less time in the day eating if your goal is to put on weight and muscle you asked me about my own own feeding window i'm a competitive bodybuilder i'm in a muscle building phase right now i love the research on time restricted feeding i i love the research on chrono nutrition i see these benefits but at the end of the day for me to get the calories i need to grow i i can't reduce my feeding window anymore so i really enjoy those points you made well, look, uh, you, you've hit the nail on the head with regard to the athlete. At the moment, as I said earlier, I can't think of any benefit that the athlete would have from time-restricted feeding uh, unless they want to shed weight or anything else. And then again, the athlete is not concerned with weight. As you pointed out, you want to increase your muscle mass. So I think the scales and a lot of these studies, you know, the Sutton studies and the, the Gill and Panda studies and these guys, they're great scientists, don't get me wrong. But when you just measure, you know, someone on a scale, that for me and you doesn't tell me anything whatsoever. I want to look at body composition, not the scale weight. So again, for your audience, the scale weight just measures how much of you are there. It doesn't tell us anything about your body composition, your lean mass, your fat mass. And those things are very, very important for your metabolic health. So, yeah, time restricted feeding for you is it would be a no, no. You've got to put back the energy, particularly the protein post exercise as quickly as possible. There, There is no window or restrictions for you particularly if athletes you know young athletes as well are trying to lose weight and I think a good point there Mike is that you know I get phone calls from parents of school kids literally saying should I be doing this and I'm like no I really admire you for reading this literature but no 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 your child's 16 or 17 they're still growing they are still changing body composition maturation and everything else do not worry about time-restricted feeding now. It's not something you should be paying attention to. So it's good that you echo that message. I agree. Yeah, I, I like you touching on metabolic health there because that, that's a large component of why we're so interested in this. It can improve metabolic health, but also at the end of the day, when it comes to improving glucose tolerance or, or postprandial glycemic response, having more muscle is going to deal with glucose quite well. Well, again... You've read very well, you know, 70 or 80 percent of a glucose load after a meal is taken up by insulin sensitive sensitive tissues and mostly by skeletal muscles. So if I'm always saying to the overweight person, you need to increase your metabolic sink. And they say, what do you mean? I say it's your muscle that takes up the glucose. You need to increase your muscle mass. And when I say that simple message, I think they get it. They realize that the scale is not, you know, the one all and end all. They realize that their muscle mass is very important. That's why we put our diabetics on resistance training programs to try and increase their muscle mass as well as their cardiorespiratory fitness to burn some more calories. So, yeah, agree. We're in perfect agreement on this one. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I think we've covered a uh, most of the topics here. So, something we skipped over, but I think would be a good idea to come back to in in this concept of aligning our nutrition with our circadian biology and how you know these different factors when we exercise uh, can influence this. When we look at consistent meal timing and the potential role that that can have, it, is there a benefit when it comes to the postprandial response to meals by eating your meals at, at a similar time each day and consuming the, the same number of meals each day, or does it not really matter? <laughs> 
That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think of studies that immediately pop to mind. Um, if you're on a regimented, let's call it a regimented, but a, a pretty set schedule and you're not doing shift work and, and the such like, excuse me, I'm going to have a sneeze here. Uh, it's hay fever season here in Australia and uh, for some reason I seem to have got this <laughs> very late in my life. Anyway, we digress. Sorry about that, audience. Um, look, my, I, I can't point you to, to studies that have specifically looked at that question. You know, it's very, very hard for the simple reason that, you know, if you've got someone who's been on a, a certain feeding regimen, let's call it for years and years and years, bringing them into the lab and changing it for eight weeks probably isn't going to do miracles and you probably can't get the answer that you're looking for. So that's my scientific hat on there. Um, as far as, you know, having a, a set or routine meal pattern, I think that's very good for circadian biology. Um, as we've said, you know, this is a this is something which is very relevant for uh, light, dark cycle, exercise, timing of meals, and everything else. A lot of cues: the ghrelin, the leptin, the adiponectin, and the uh, the hormones to do with nutrition. The push pull model that I explained. Hopefully, you know, we have a body which reacts to things, and at the end of the day, our body's trying to bring us back into homeostasis. And I guess this is a a good way to to sort of end this segue. Is is that at the end of the day, anything you do, be it exercise, be it nutrition, you know, be it a massive perturbation to your physiology, such as jet lag. Artist to bring you back to baseline and homeostasis. And that's what the body does at all times. So when you mess the circadian biology up, believe it or not, shift workers eating at night, late night snacking. The body is still trying to bring you back to that homeostatic steady state. Now, if you do it enough times, you'll mess it up and you'll completely mess, you know, the super charismatic nucleus and all the peripheral clues up. But at the moment, you know, in the short term, the body is still trying to do what it does best, which is try and maintain homeostasis. And I think the best homeostatic model is one where we align our feeding with normal circadian biology such that all these cues are, if you like, in line with each other and synchronized. So you know, again, if you're a shift worker, I'm, I'm not saying that's a negative thing at all. You will have to do that. But uh, you try and think about nutritional cues and perhaps where you put exercise and meals in to, to reduce the impact of that negative synchronicity on circadian biology. Excellent. Dr. Hawley, before we transition into our final question, perhaps just to sum up a few of these points and, and practical takeaways for the listeners, I would say based on what we've covered, it, it seems pretty clear that it not only can people who are cardiometabolically compromised benefit from utilizing extended periods of fasting, but it sounds like for the healthy individual as well, uh, they could benefit from this practice. I think so. And I guess it's, um, you know, prevention is better than cure there. I mean, if people did align to this before this even comes out in the nutrition guidelines, um, I think it would be very, very beneficial. You know, as we said very quickly, you know, the rates of obesity, uh, cardiovascular disease and everything else are rising across the world. And I think this is a one simple strategy. If you, you know, your listeners take one message away is just reduce the window that you're eating. Just reduce that eating window and see what happens. You'll, I, I have never, ever had a phone call or a conversation where someone has come back and said, you know, I've put on weight or I feel worse. Uh, you know, we haven't touched on a lot of things, but, you know, Time restricted feeding improves sleep. It, it 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 improves your appetite. It improves a whole host of things that we haven't discussed. But general health and well being is important. So yes, I think is that just pay attention to the timing of your food intake and try and reduce that feeding window. Excellent. Now you might have alluded to your answer to our final question today a few times, but you, you might have some other ideas to bring to the table. So when I have on a an esteemed nutrition researcher like yourself, I have to throw out this very broad question regarding this obesity crisis that we're dealing with. It's not getting any better. Each year, the rates are rising. With that being said, where have we gone wrong? Have we placed too great of an emphasis on certain concepts? Should we be sh shifting our research focus to other areas? What are your thoughts in this quest to attenuate the obesity crisis? Wow. Okay. <laughs> How long have you got? Now, look, uh, it's, it's a really, really relevant question. It should be worrying a lot of 
you know, world health uh, authorities and organizations. I think in brief that we've placed far too much emphasis on the macronutrient content of the diet. You know, we've been saying, you know, you don't need carbs or you need fat or you don't need this or you need more protein. I think that's somewhere where the message has got diluted. And I think if you, you know, walk down the street and picked 100 people off and said, you know, is a high, high carb diet good or is a high fat, there'd be much confusion. So that's the first instance. We've paid too much attention to just concentrating on the macronutrients. Secondly, I think as scientists, health, I think we've really got the message jumbled and I think we are confusing the public. So I think the scientist has a role to play in educating the public. Thirdly, and they're in this with us, is the media. The media hops on, you know, I'm not even going to mention your recent election, but the media hops on stuff like you wouldn't believe. And, you know, I, 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 I hate to use the word fake news, but there is a lot of fake information about there. It's no, co it's no coincidence that, you know, your New, New York Times bestsellers list are full of either diet books or recipe books. I, I mean, what's going on there? You know, you've got a big, big, big problem there. So how to get the message across is very, very important. And as we've said earlier, the, you know, there is no mention of the timing of food in any dietary guidelines. Now, your average person off the street isn't going to look at the national guidelines. So we as scientists, you as, you know, people who put this out in the media and do a great job of providing scientific information, we have to educate. So I think the education is of vital, vital importance. I'm not too worried what the message actually is, so long as the message is getting across and it's clear the message isn't getting at the moment. Maybe it's the wrong message, but it's also the way we're delivering the message. So I think we all have to sort of put our hands in our pockets here and, and put our thinking caps on and say, look, we could do a better job of educating everyone across the board. Fantastic. With that being said, Dr. Holly, I want to applaud you for the introduction section on your paper chrononutrition for the prevention and treatment of obesity and type 2 diabetes from mice to men. You had a nice little blurb in there about the popular media. And this quote in particular uh, stuck out to me. And that was, consequently, often the most popular, loudest, and most extreme voices drown out the well-informed. And that just speaks volumes about the media, the information that they're putting out. It might not be great information, but it's loud, it's in your face, and unfortunately, that's what people are consuming rather than the science on the topic. Well, look, Mike, that is a great place to finish. And as I say, programs like this really, really help. But again, just to your audience, Twitter is not scientific information, all right? Twitter is a popular media, and all these popular media things where messages get taken from scientific studies and then blown out of all proportion. We need to scale it back. We need to say, right, this is interesting. Let's go and follow up the paper or like you obviously do, look at the scientific literature, read it and interpret it. So I'm, I think social media is a double-edged sword. I think it's the media we've got to use to get the message out, but the message has to be scientifically valid and correct. And, you know, that, that's why I do these things. And, you know, when people like you say, do you want to come on? I'm like, yeah, I can do this. You know, it's another interview type thing, but it's really, really, really important. And I can't stress that enough. You know, the scientific message given in a in a form that people can digest and consume and take home, I think is very, very important. And I think that's where we've got a duty to to educate. And hopefully, you know, that's a, a process which is slowly evolving. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve with this podcast. Dr. Holly, that's all I have for you today. I am super appreciative of your time. I know you have a busy day ahead, but from the Muscle Memoirs, we thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. It's really good. And I, I love the Muscle Memoirs uh, name. I just think that's so cool. So look, continue doing the good work and, you know, happy to, to come on whenever you need me or whenever you want me and just, you know, keep putting the message out there that science is important and if america needs to know that you know you're in the middle of a covid epidemic at the moment which is out of control listen to the scientists <laughs> absolutely everyone that does it for another episode of the muscle memoirs podcast thank you so much for listening hey guys mike here if you're interested in learning more about how to maximize your health body composition and performance head over to hammerawayfitness.com where you can sign up for coaching or even just schedule an hour consult with me to get some of your training and nutrition questions answered. Also, if you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, 
and would like to further support the growth of the Muscle Memoirs podcast, you can give a donation to the link in the show notes, leave us a review, and or share this episode with your friends, whether that be dropping the link in a group chat or putting a screenshot in your Instagram story. I truly appreciate it.